Maria Lola, who he was so kind to donate his time to discuss um, his work, what he does in life, and obviously um, take your questions. Um, I'm going to give Miltos a moment to introduce himself and just say a little bit about himself, what he does, and any fun facts he'd like to share with us. So Miltos, you have the floor. Uh, Miltos, you there? I think I might be having my problem. A uh, little less can you on maybe DM him. Oh, oh there you are. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, ah, there we go. Uh, I don't know what I did. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, we can still hear you. Oh, good, because I could hear you, but uh, I wasn't. I don't think you could hear me, but that's good. All right, here I am. Uh, hello, this is Miltos. Um, I'm being a complete grandfather about this. I'm <laughs> kind of not really knowing how to work this, this chat room, but I am here now, and... Um, lovely to meet you all or to speak to you all so uh, greetings um so Miltos would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself and um you know what you do in life and the things you enjoy and just give us a bit of an introduction about you yeah sure um so my name is Miltos Girolamo and uh, I'm an actor and uh uh, I have been doing this goddamn job for what feels like uh, an eternity, uh, about 30 years. Um, and I have uh, mainly worked in theatre and in the last probably about 10 years, uh, more and more in TV and film. Um, kind of started off in quite avant-garde experimental uh, stuff um, where we kind of put on plays uh, for example uh, the story of uh, the uh, invasion of of Mexico by the Spaniards and the decimation of the Aztec um, culture and we did it with like four people and uh, I played a horse in that so that kind of thing um, so we so and uh, and you know worked with devised theatre companies, uh, toured all over the place with them, and and uh, kind of I feel like doing much more legitimate uh, stuff now. Um, both my parents are, are Greek Cypriots; they are in Cyprus as we speak, in a tiny little village where they were born and grew up, known each other pretty much all their lives. Uh, my parents are they were they had a fish and chip shop and I was never going to go into that because I started working there when I was about 12 years old and uh, by the time I was about 16 I was like I'm not going to be doing this for a career and uh, decided to pursue something else and found myself doing more and more creative things and doing things like plays at school which were my way in at school because I was I wouldn't say that I enjoyed school very much at all um, but my one connection to to school was through doing school plays, and I guess that's where I ended up. That's uh, that's really amazing that you came so far um, from you know obviously not really having an actor's background in regards to your parents and and absolutely. being able to take it and you know like a duck to water. Um, we have a couple of really interesting questions that I'd like to start with. Um, yeah, Dando has asked. What do you look for in a screenplay and what tips would you give to an aspiring uh, screenwriter? 
so it's kind of a it's a really interesting question that because of course you know we love to kind of we all of course I have an opinion of what really draws me to a script or to a story um but the reality is that it's it's quite rare to be given uh, a choice <laughs> you know for most of us are looking for work and uh, are very grateful when it comes along especially when it comes to tv and film because there's so little of it uh, relatively speaking in compared to theater especially in in the uk um but 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 for example there's a play that um i was working on uh, we had only just started working on it before it was cancelled due to uh, all the lockdowns because of um, the COVID crisis. And um, and I would always say that any story has to uh, surprise me, has to kind of find a way of engaging me almost immediate, immediately. And this play did. It was called, it's by a young uh, writer called... Um, Oh my God, what is his name? You wait there while I just... Ah. Sammy Ibrahim. Two Palestinians go dogging. Uh, just the title itself is kind of enough to kind of perks anyone's interest, but it's a very, very fascinating play. A lot of it is to do with style, I think. You know, how does uh, the voice of the character, how do, you know what is what, what is the perspective of the of the writer, and also why are you telling that story? Uh, those two things are I feel really crucial about why you would do any kind of work. And when I first started, of course, the most what what you'd always do is that you just say you say yes to anything because what you want to do is you want to work. And I learned about ten years ago that I wasn't enjoying doing the work I was doing because I was just saying yes without really considering the work I was doing and and after I made a conscious effort to do stuff that I really felt I was connected to it just let it just meant that the work I ended up doing became much more interesting last year I did a play all about uh suicide and it was by a, an opera singer uh, an opera director and he created this this piece of theater which was unlike anything I'd ever done before, we were reading extracts of, of uh, writers uh, and, you know, their, their um, experiences with depression and, uh, uh, and mental ill, uh, uh, you know, health issues. And it was, it was really powerful, but in ways that you would not expect. There was a, there was a quartet that played classical music throughout it. And we just read these, these pieces uh but it was incredibly affecting and of course it it, it was a subject which uh people connected with on lots of different levels so what i'm interested in is 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 why you why you have a story to tell and that is always the thing that i look for in a script is if that is clear if that is if if that's kind of very vital and immediate thing then then it really always gets my attention Okay, great. Um, Lord19 has another question, which kind of links into a statement you made about COVID-19. Um, how do you suggest practicing in this time where we are isolated and unable to uh, be around each other? I mean, what's interesting is that uh, people are doing stuff. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, it's an amazing thing. Uh, uh, it can sound kind of trite, but you know situations like this always seem to bring out people's creativity and and that is always uh, a really uh, surprising and exciting thing that no matter how bad the crisis is it, it, it you know people's creativity doesn't see, doesn't seem to get dampened and particularly with what is going on now where we are kind of locked in our homes it, it, people are finding new and imaginative ways of still communicating. Like, for example, there is a friend of mine who who has teamed up with a writer and he's doing like COVID diaries and, and they basically created a character, a Welsh character. Um, uh, and I'll get in touch with the, the moderators and I might find, uh, 
get links to all of these things so that people can can follow them up. So they te- so my friend teamed up with a writer to create a character who was dealing with with uh, being locked in his home, um, and it and it's it's fantastic. And so people are finding new ways of 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 still telling stories, but we're just doing it in a in a in a different way. And of course, we are living in an age where we have the ability at least you know some of us have the ability to to be able to connect via uh, the internet and and be able to connect through tiny little screens uh, that we all carry around with us so that so so I think there are always ways always uh, different ways of finding ways to tell stories and communicating them and especially at the moment we're doing it we seem to be doing it so that leads on to another great question from Steamy. Um, they ask, um, in regards to your roles, they want to know, one, which is the one you're most recognised for? And two, which one do you think is the one you should be most recognised for? Which, are the, which is the one you're most proud of? <laughs> I guess, uh, um, you know, I, I could talk about, you know, some really... Um, I mean, there's so, there's so many things that I've done which I found incredibly uh, 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 fulfilling. Uh, half of them, no one ever saw because <laughs> no one came to see them. Uh, the 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 others are, of course, really well known. For example, uh, ten years ago, I I was fortunate enough to be cast in in a, a little TV show called Game of Thrones and uh, I was in the first season and played a, a character that taught Arya Stark how to sword fight and uh, that is the, the role that I am most famous for um, and and I could say that oh god you know it was 10 years ago and I have you know I've done other things since then you know but it, it, I do feel incredibly proud um, I remember uh, Mark Addy and Sean Bean, just to drop a couple of names. Talking, we were talking about well while we were filming it, talking about the experience of doing it. And those two actors, of course, Sean Bean, who's kind of done pretty much everything, and has been in every genre, and is an incredibly well known and well loved actor. Even he said, you know, you know that you, this is a once in a lifetime experience when you get to do a production like this, because there will never be another production like this that that kind of connects. And this is even in the first season before we really knew that it was going to take off. That you, We just could tell that uh, because of the, re- the reputation of HBO and, and, the, and the cast they would assembled. Um, that it was going to be something special. And, and even they said they recognised that this is a, uh, something that you, you we will, you know, if this is the only thing you ever do, then you can count yourself like you've done something, you've achieved something. So, um, so that, of course, is something I'm incredibly proud of. And also to play a character that, that seems to have captured people's imagination. Of course, the character had already done that in the book, so um, there was no pressure there. <laughs> Um, but my theatre work is is different because the th- the stuff that I'm really proud of when it comes to theatre is is the Shakespeare stuff because I wasn't very academic as a kid and I didn't enjoy school and I felt like it was it was it was something that I was terrified of and didn't really enjoy in any way and so I remember when I ended up working at the RSC I really felt out of my depth but. I learned so much and I completely fell in love with Shakespeare because I never fell in love with it when I was at school, but I definitely did it when I started performing it. And now uh, playing the comic clown roles is something that uh, I think that I I will never get tired of because it's like a it's like a puzzle you're always trying to unlock meaning and try and find a way especially the the clown and comic roles in Shakespeare which can be incredibly complicated because it's all kind of playing on words and um, it's always about how do you communicate those really really old jokes to a modern audience and how do you make them relevant and and that is kind of a bit of a, a puzzle which and a challenge which I really really always enjoy doing. Okay, so that's a great time to ask some of our more theatre-based questions. 
Um, Ozfox has a great question about um, how you're cast in roles. So I'm going to unmute him because he wants to ask you directly. Um, so okay. bear with me one second. Um, yeah, hey. Um, so I'm just wondering specifically Hello. Um, about your theatre roles, because I'm, I'm a huge fan of um, a lot of your newer work, specifically with um, like the Brighton Hand Theatre and stuff. I'm just wondering, mm. specifically with these roles, are you specifically um, typecasted for these, or have you been specifically approaching um, a people organising it specifically to try to play? Because I, I noticed that a lot of the time you are playing um, either the fool or some form of character that acts as like the chorus. Um, so I'm just wondering, generally, are you searching for these roles, or are you uh, are you being specifically typecast, uh, typecasted for these? Um, so that's a really good question, and the answer to it is that when it comes to doing TV and film, uh, casting directors really do just look at the stuff that you you've done, and that that's. Uh, very clear that uh, you end up getting typecast and what's very fascinating is that when it comes to TV and film I'm always cast as foreign characters like if you need someone who can do uh, an Italian accent or a French accent or, a, or who can play you know a, a range of kind of southern European Middle Eastern uh, characters uh, that's when I get called up especially if it's filming in, in London, because obviously there you are, you can either, I mean, you know, of course, uh, nowadays it's, it's, you're more likely to find a, a Middle Eastern actor to do that. Um, but when it comes to theatre, it, it's kind of different because I get cast because of my reputation as, as uh, an ensemble uh actor like a character actor so uh i do obviously play a lot of clown character uh, comic parts but that's just because i've just so, done so much of it that i will always say yes to doing that kind of stuff because i enjoy it but as i've got older the more the things that i like the most is when i get put in outside my comfort zone and i have to do something that i really find quite difficult i know it's perverse but you know that's just me i just like i need it because i, I get I have a very short attention span so i i really need to be challenged otherwise i just get bored um my 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 uh my love for the profession is quite tenuous because obviously obviously it's incredibly unpredictable so i as i've got older the thing that i really really like the most is getting something that will really 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 challenge me so so with theatre it's much more about uh the director so um a lot of uh, my colleagues have ended up running theatres and uh directing plays and because they know me they know that i bring something to a company not necessarily um you know a specific role but they'll have me in the company because they know that i you know i'm a bit of a director i understand um play structure and stuff like that so 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 it's good to have me in the room because i'm really good when it comes to to just collaborating and just you know feeding information and and creating stuff and directors always like uh, actors in theater who who have lots of ideas because theater is a much more collaborative uh event um uh, TV and film is as well, but 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 the the roles are much more delineated. It's it's very democratic uh, because everyone has a role to play and everyone does that role incredibly well. But but with theatre, the creation of the play is something that is kind of happening all the time. And so having actors who kind of understand mise en scene and and all of that kind of stuff it is kind of quite important to directors and writers. So. Um, I find that when it comes to theatre, uh, I'm I'm kind of cast much more for what I bring to the company rather than to a specific role, and that's kind of re uh, uh, you know uh, confirmed in the fact that as I've got older, them I do much more diverse uh, uh, kind of roles, which is is really exciting. And of course, when it comes to the clown roles, the Shakespearean clown and 
uh, there's a huge difference between a, a, a character like uh, the Dromios from Comedy of Errors and uh, King Lear's Fool. I mean, they're, com- you know, they're, they're virtually, you can't even kind of compare them as, as comic relief roles. They're not that. So, so uh, there's huge uh, variety in, even in, in, the, in, the, in that kind of genre role. That was a very long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that no, was a great you. answer. Thank you so much. Um, so we have a question that sort of leads from this, um, from Consul Eris. I'm doing really asks, good with... <laughs> you're doing great, Will Toss. No, really, no, I was just really saying I'm doing, I'm doing really well with the segueing. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, 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 great. Um, so uh, Eris asks, why do you think so many theatre actors go to television in the UK but you don't see that kind of thing in the US as much. Uh, because uh, we, it's the only time we earn any money. <laughs> That's the God honest truth. It's like, uh, if we get the opportunity to do TV and film, it's because we get we, we go, oh, thank God, for once we're going to actually get paid a decent wage. Because theatre, you really can't make a, 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 a live. You can't live on the wages in theatre, unfortunately. Um, uh, that's not completely a joke it's actually very true but 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 it's also because of the opportunities like you know uh it's it's for british actors we're so lucky because for a long long time uh we had a we had we'd really our, our film industry was really kind of weak and i wouldn't say we have a great film industry we make movies but most of the movies we make are made with American money. But but what, what has really changed in the last 10, 15 years is that people, American studios, are making stuff in the UK and in Europe. And of course, if you're going to make something in Europe, then uh, the reputation of British actors is so... Uh, is, is so highly valued amongst cast and directors and directors and writers that that we're the go-to and we're very 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 lucky because of that and I don't and I think it, it we, we've debated this so many times amongst ourselves about why uh, the Americans like British actors um, so much but I, I what I think ultimately is because of the training so a lot of it is to do with the fact that we do the work on stage and we kind of hone our craft and uh, get experience from doing work in a in a very particular medium, which is on stage. So you get actors, be- and from what I, I I answered previously to the last question, we're great collaborators, and everyone needs to collaborate to make really good work. Um, you can have a fantastic idea and a fantastic script as a writer, but if you kind of marry that with a great actor who can look at that, look at those lines, and understand that character so well, that can just tweak nuances or moments in a scene to really bring out what the writer has has already created then you're turning something that is brilliant into something that can be quite sublime and so and i think that a lot of people appreciate that that kind of ability in a british actor to do that i'm not saying that american actors don't do it of course they do but um uh, there's uh, most um, uh, American actors that I know just work get, do the work by just doing the work. So the training part or the the the, the learning the analysis um, isn't something so conscious. Uh, all actors are doing the same thing, which is just trying to interpret characters in a in a human way that that an audience can relate to and can make sense of and and can feel like it's the truth. But the difference is that uh, British actors are consciously always trained to do it. So maybe there is a difference there. Plus, I think uh, everyone loves a British accent. And maybe that is also something uh, a little bit kind of facile, but also quite true. OK, that leads into another question that's been asked by Meow <laughs> uh, who asks, what was it about Shakespeare's work that attracted your uh, philosophical uh, how does playing a character on stage differ from playing a character on television? Uh, so uh, I'll answer the last part first. So the difference between playing an, a, a character on stage and a, a character 
in TV and film is the rehearsal. You don't get any rehearsal when you're doing film and TV. You're just expected to learn the lines, turn up and just make sure you are in the moment. You're just reacting to what's going on. The director may kind of ask you to kind of uh, show him or her what you're going to do in the scene, but that isn't because they're interested in how you're going to act it. By the time you're on on a set, they know how you're going to act it because you've either done a, a test with 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 you know a major scene, so they really understand that either you know you know they're looking for something that 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 you've shown them and and they're going to just trust that. Most of the time, it's just where you're going to put the cam with the cameras so that they capture the scene. In theatre, of course, it's all about the rehearsal. It's all about how do you find a way to tell that story and, cre and create dynamics on stage that will um, illustrate uh, the story in a, in a vivid and uh, interesting way, stimulating way. So it's, I think that is the real fundamental difference, is the rehearsing. The rehearsal is where you collaborate and pick things apart. Sometimes you pick things apart so much that you end up completely confused with what you're going to do. So there's a very fine line between uh, understanding what you're doing, trying to find that thing where you're just in the moment because it always has to be just in the moment you're trying to recreate something that happens naturally on a tv and film set more and more now because of course remember you know in the 50s theater was a very different to what it's like now in the 50s it was very kind of like you know uh, grotesque makeup and 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 quite hammy styles of acting uh, even Lawrence Olivier one of the kind of greats you know, some of his performances were, you know, really, in the true sense of the word, theatrical, you know. And and nowadays, putting makeup on stage is like, people would think you're crazy unless you're doing a pantomime to do that. So, so even theatre has kind of become more subtle. And the theatres have changed in re to reflect that. So now, you know, if you're doing Shakespeare... Uh, the big pros arch theatres, we, we've kind of got rid of those. Even the RSC changed their their whole their whole theatre and turned it into a thrust stage because Shakespeare works best when it's intimate, where you understand and see the, the how the monologues play because they're internal thoughts most of the time, and so you're trying to see inside the character's head, and so the more intimate um, Shakespeare is, the more powerful and the more engaging it is. And if you're too far away from it and it's too much like a spectacle, it, you lose the sense of what it really is. Because Shakespeare is about words. You know, when Shakespeare talks about you, you listen to a play, it, it's not um, uh, it's not counterintuitive because you are truly listening to a play. And so when you do a, a Shakespeare play, the, the, the key is to not get in the way of the words. And it's hard because... Uh, it's it, it relies on something else, which is a, a certain confidence to just be able to trust that the words are going to communicate the story. So your job is trying to find ways of really communicating those thoughts that are sometimes incredibly complicated because of how those lines are structured and turning them into something that audiences emotionally react to and understand. And that is the kind of the the skill of a really good Shakespearean actor. It's kind of the thing that Ian McKellen used to do and still does kind of effortlessly and we all kind of cry when we watch him perform because we just go, I wish, I wish I could do it like that. But that is kind of what we're always kind of trying to, uh, we're trying to aspire to do. Uh, I, I, and please forgive me if I uh, forgot what the first part of your question was. Can you, can you just make sure that I, I answered it? I think you did a wonderful job answering Miltos. Um, wow. So we have we have a couple of questions from uh, Jelly Vess, which is, um, what was the best age of acting in theatre in your opinion? And who is your favourite actor to work with today? Oh, that's a really good question. The best age to be acting. God, sometimes I think it's right now. I think theatre has got better and better in its 
uh, in its approach to telling a story. You know, like if you think about it, as I said in the past, uh, the spectacle of it. Um, I mean, if you look at certain, like in the eighties, uh, the 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 um, the Russian and Eastern European theatre companies, uh, Moscow Arts Theatre, uh, people like Peter Stein um, from Germany. I mean, the Berliner Ensemble in the sixties. These were companies that were creating uh, uh, plays that that were spectacle. I mean, the design of them were like. I mean, if anyone has seen opera, you kind of know what I'm talking about because opera uses design in a in a in a kind of scale, kind of creates something that can sometimes be literal, but invariably and and more commonly is about creating uh, an expressionistic uh, landscape for the story to happen. And those Eastern, Eastern European directors from the Berliner Ensemble and people like Grotowski, and we're talking like from the 60s through to the 80s, were creating stuff that no one had ever seen. Peter Brook, of course, creating uh, really expressionistic landscapes to set their stories. And their stories were epic and huge, and even their Shakespeare was kind of epic and huge. Um, I remember seeing uh, 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 an Eastern European, uh, Eastern German production of Macbeth, whereby uh, as Macbeth became more and more, uh, his power, you know, uh, kind of bloated him, as he came back on stage, he'd look fatter and fatter until by the end, it was him and Macduff when they were doing their fight at the end, where these two guys in huge fat suits swinging these giant swords at each other. And it was kind of, you know, it was... It was, it was, uh, you'd think it was like, it would make you laugh and it was a joke, but it didn't because of the, how they, how they handled it. It just, you could completely understood that these people had become bloated by either their tragedy or their power. And it was really powerful. And it was really, you know, it's kind of something so bold, bold that British directors would never go near that because they just think it, people would laugh at it. But because uh, it was created in such a an environment of you know rehearsing for months and months and months and you know creating something and putting it on stage and realizing what was good and what was bad about it and over years like Peter Stein's companies would stay together for years and years and years and they'd do the same production of the Cherry Orchard over and over again and and those productions just got honed into just perfection. Uh, something that obviously in Britain we couldn't do because we were, we, it's, it's a financial thing, you know, we just can't afford to keep companies together like that. So so we got rid of all of that because because it's a financial, you know, it costs a lot of money to do a production like that and let it run and run and run. But uh, to me, those were the most inspiring times because that's where uh, it, we left the literal sense of recreating words and just putting them on stage you know we moved away from french windows and tables with gl glasses of whiskey and turned them into something much more expressionistic and more like nightmares or dreams and and they seem to kind of you know plays thrived in in, in environments like that so I, I hope that answers your question I think there was two I, parts I think that was it. yeah. And um did you mention who the actor that you oh, the was actor. From acting with? Uh, Don't worry, they'll they'll No, I, I do have one. I do ha no, I do I I um I I was really excited. One of the first jobs I did when I went to the RSC, I did Winter's Tale and it was with, with Anthony Sher. And I remember reading his book as a student. Uh, as a drama student at uh, the year of the king about his year of playing Richard III and I was really blown away by that book because it was you know I hadn't really read any kind of actors biographies up until that point and it really left a, a deep impression on me and then I got the opportunity to work with him and watching him like firsthand and at close quarters how he does his, the things that he does and he's quite a theatrical actor you know he's kind of in that kind of traditional tradition of of um of uh 
of of Laurence Olivier. But then and then but then I got the chance to work with um, Kenneth Branagh, and he is just and uh, something else because he was directing and performing the lead role and watching him do both things at the same time literally just blew my mind i had no idea how how uh, someone like that can hold that amount those those amounts of uh, plates spinning in the air and just did that day after day after day after day and and kind of made it look effortless um and then i got a chance to work with rory kinnear um on a play called uh, Young uh, Young Marx, all about Karl Marx, uh, his 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 young days when he he was first in in London, and Rory Kinnear is is one of my favourite actors at the moment, and he really was uh, really exciting. So so those three are are my highlights. Okay, great. Um, we're probably going to come back round to politics in a second because we've had a lot of questions about your political values so hopefully yes. you won't be able to answer <laughs> no, um, no. but before we go on to politics quickly footy surfer has asked sort of a follow-up question from um the question of who you've worked with that you've enjoyed the most but do you have a dream actor that you would like to work with in the future and hope to in, in the future to come i mean i would have loved to i mean you know uh judy dench I, I think you know she's getting older and older, and obviously as she used to. But I would have loved to have done a play with Judy Dench. I think she's amazing. I was lucky enough to be at the RSC when she was doing a play, but we were doing two different plays. I did get a chance to to, to dance with her at the Christmas party, and that was my claim to fame. <laughs> but um, but no, I think she's. A, a, a phenomenal actress and really a sensational amazing thoughtful incredibly uh uh you know she's just it's one of it's one of those people like the, the are always the great actors are the ones who just make it look effortless uh and it's not it never is effortless they just it's just an illusion that it's effortless but but just the the confidence of just having done so much work and knowing what 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 she needs to do to do what she does um is really exciting to always watch on on in theatre and on st- uh, 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 and on st- uh, TV and film. Okay, fantastic. Are you ready for the political questions, Miltos? Yes, I am. Bring them on. Fantastic. Um, so, Magister Chanel asks: Having done young Marx, are you a Marxist? How sympathetic to Marxist values are you? And what do you think of Jeremy Corbyn and the recent Labour movement? Uh, oh, sorry, she wanted to say that in voice chat. I will unmute her. I'm sorry, Chanel. I didn't mean to write, say it for you. Um, um, yeah, yeah. no, I just wanted to know, since you did Young Marx, um, are you sympathetic to Marxism? Like, what, what were the cast like as well? Like, were they sympathetic to Marxism? Is it like a... It's, I mean, it's really interesting because, of course, of course, we, we did, uh, just to answer your p- point, yes, I am very sympathetic to Marxism. I would pretty much call myself a Marxist and, and proud of it. Um, but uh, it's interesting, you know, you do like a play like that and you do it at the Bridge Theatre and it all feels very middle class and the majority of your audiences that come to see it are people, you know, of a certain age and a certain, um, you know, demographic and, and and it feels very middle class and you just go oh, you're the coming to watch a play about Marx and, and and that kind of feels really weird you know but the reality is is that of course I mean I think if you look at most actors and people uh, in the creative field we are much more sympathetic to Marxism than to anything else because you know that those those uh that analysis of uh, of the economic model or of capitalism it just feels like is is proved over and over and over and over and here we are once again showing how fragile capitalism is and and it's like oh there you go so i i do think that uh, we we did get to some of that in the play um, it was a kind of comedy uh, it, it was it was a new place, so it, it began one way, kind of veered into another 
you know, and it's hard, you know, what do you do? You're going to do a play about uh, young Marx and uh, it's written by the guy who wrote uh, um, One Man, Two Governors at the at the National, uh, the version of Gold Goldoni's um, Servant of Two Masters. And uh, and so you expect it to be funny. <laughs> so, and, and it was funny. There was just some very, very touching moments, but it also was an interesting uh, look at something that, you know, it was is a true story, and uh, at the time, immigration was a huge issue, and uh, and in in you know, uh, just after the French Revolution, it was in 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 London. You know, it's like things come around; we go full circle over and over again. It's like they were having the same issue, you know, Germans and for the French escaping uh, persecution, coming to London where they found safe haven. You know, these things just seem to be happening and happen o- over and over again. Um, that's really interesting. Can I ask a follow up question? Yeah, of course. Um, like, so I know, like, Jeremy Corbyn's technically a socialist. And, like, I'm so sorry, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't quite finish the, that that question. I will go, come on to Jeremy Cord- Corbyn as well. Yeah, like, do you, uh, like, are you are you into like the Labour movement, or are you in like I don't know some sort of other Marxist group or something in the UK? So I was. Um... I don't, I've always been quite, uh, uh, I grew up in Eastbourne, right? And I don't know if you know much about uh, the provincial seaside towns of the UK, but my parents had a fish and chip shop in Eastbourne and it, it's a really conservative little town. I mean, it's that and Brighton, which is its next door neighbour, is chalk and cheese. Uh, Brighton being quite um, bohemian and, you know, progressive minded. Of course, we've got our only green mp uh in the uk who is in brighton and eastbourne always having um uh conservative or very right-leaning liberal democrats uh, running it uh i hated it there and as soon as i could leave i didn't go back and uh much to to any whenever i mention that on twitter everyone kind of piles on me because they just say oh how dare you eastbourne you know thanks very much you know, asshole. So, so uh, I, 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 when I was about, I don't know, 15, 16, I joined the uh, Young Labour movement and I'd go to conference. Uh, I didn't do any debating or stand up or do any speeches. I was far too introverted to do that. But um, I, I was involved and I, and I, it was at the time Militant was, was a big thing. And I was selling Militant on the streets of Eastbourne. Of course, I didn't sell a single copy. So I would just use my pocket money to, to buy all the, the newspapers so I didn't have to send them back. Um, and so that's kind of the ridiculous stuff I used to get up to. And then, of course, um, we were very excited about um, uh, Tony Blair and the new Labour movement. We, I mean, I was very aware, but, you know, he was not going to be... The, the socialist we were looking for, but at least after Thatcherism, we were excited that we were going to have a Labour government uh, mm. in 1990. To find that, then of course the Iraq War happened, and and uh, you know the rest is history. But I kind of fell out of love with the Labour Party and stopped being a member uh, until Corbyn was elected, and and when he got elected, I I rejoined. And became much more active in in the Labour Party again. Obviously, as a long many years have passed since then, but uh, I got really excited because I thought for, for for maybe for once, and of course it kind of felt like it was the right time. In the same way with Bernie Sanders, um, you know, suddenly people were understanding that the limits of 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 uh, capitalism and the amount of inequalities that were just growing year by year and of course because of you know what happened with the financial crash in 2008 just kind of felt like this is exactly the time this is when but but of course you know it always felt like it was a youth movement uh the the parliamentary labor party hated corbyn and did everything it could let alone let alone the, his the natural enemies the people on the right and the and the and the media but his own labor party hated him so you know considering all of that to last four and a half years is is quite an achievement so 
you know, I was very disappointed with the election result, but, you know, Brexit was a, a shit show and there was no way we were going to really get around that, that awful question that, that we ended up, uh, you know, being stuck in. So, you know, and here we are, you know, with a world full of leaders who have no right to lead, you know, who literally have, the, it's, it's as if the pretense of pretending that uh, we have uh, leaders in America and all over the place, uh, and this the, the pretense of um, this this uh, the established view, which is, you know, whatever you think about the way of the world, you know, it's in safe hands, you know, this is the way it is, and you should be grateful to not live in, you know, some country that doesn't have the the you know the 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 structures and the de democratic structures that that we have like you know free courts and a free press and all of that stuff so count yourself lucky and be grateful and shut up that's kind of the world we lived in but now of course it's like the pretense like the gloves have come off and no one gives a shit anymore i'm talking about leaders now so you have leaders who like, like absolutely openly just have contempt and disregard for everyone else and and all they're interested in is staying in power you're you're like a legend you're an actual legend that's so cool you have such cool <laughs> views i'm so shocked because i didn't think you would be like this but this is awesome yeah well yeah yeah that's me <laughs> <laughs> well thank you for answering my question pleasure it's a pleasure so this has become a hot topic and we have a lot of questions about this but i want to quickly jump to a question that was asked earlier um, from a user uh, who was interested in your views on Trump. Obviously, um, some people have noticed that you've been quite outspoken on Twitter. And um, I don't know about outspoken more than just like <laughs> just venting rage. <laughs> um, but one of the great questions that I noticed from earlier was, do you think an actor being vocal about politics comes with a cost? If yes, do you think your decision to being so vocal had or will have an impact on your career? I mean, from time to time, I think about it. Sometimes I think about it more uh, and think, you know, maybe I should just wind my neck in and just, <laughs> you know. I mean, it, it, but it comes it, not always because I worry about the consequences. I don't know what the consequences are. I don't know if anyone really gives a shit what my opinion is. I'm sure there's many, many more high profile people who who people, you know, you know, care what they have to say. Um, but the trouble is, is that I I think I, I I'm not in that place anymore where uh, the most important thing in my life is my career. I, 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 I think that what you believe in and what you stand up for is the most important thing. And, and if you have any, any, uh, influence in any way, then, then share it. I mean, we are saturated by one opinion after another, and it's always, you know, of the same value and the same tone and the same flavor and it's all about you know just you know shut up and be grateful and you know don't make a fuss because it could be much worse you know and and I just think we should our expectations have been so uh, blunted and we shouldn't be like that I mean I, if, if being a creative person has taught me anything is that the only thing that we have is our our voice and the way we express ourselves and the stories we tell and and if you can't if you can't uh, expect uh, good leaders or leaders that at least take responsibility for the job that they have sought then what on earth are we doing? What, you know, like and when people talk about, oh, don't make it political, I I've always thought that our day-to-day -day lives are political. The job you have, whether you have a job, um, you know, whether you can live on the money that you get from your job, what do you do with your free time? Every single thing that we do in life is political. And whether you like it or not, it's a political act because governments 
dictate what you what you how much you earn and whether you get a pay rise and 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 for example my my fiance holly who is just down the other end playing animal cra- uh, crossing um is is she's a school teacher right she teaches a levels and gcses and why is it that teachers and nurses and doctors and uh people who who uh clean up our shit why are these people supposed to get less money than someone who works on on wall street to me it, it it's 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 symptomatic of how fucked up our society is that that we value teachers so little or doctors or nurses i mean it doesn't and here we are here we are in a, in the middle of a crisis and every time there's a crisis who are the people we rely on doctors and nurses and teachers and all everyone that that kind of looks after our shit and looks after our children that to me is where we've always gone wrong and i think no one really ever truly uh addresses it in a way that is is um uh i just i just think it, it we seem to get bogged down in the minutiae of labels and what you believe in and whether you're a left winger or a right winger and it's you know this kind of weird false equivalence where the right wing will always kind of like say well the left are just as bad as it it's about what do you value in society what makes a decent society what do you think uh and and if uh, in my opinion a government is only there for one thing and that's to look after the most vulnerable people in our society and if we can't do that then 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 we're failing whether you're a left wing or a right winger that is the bottom line and you can't do that unless you address inequality and unfortunately capitalism is only interested in one thing and that's profits and the only way you're going to make more money than anyone else is by keeping other people not earning money there i think that is a great sentiment to have um We've had a lot of political questions, and um, one of them I think might be particularly of interest uh, to you. Um, and it comes from Caesar, and he asks, "What does he think?" Hail about... Caesar. <laughs> what do you think about the problems in Cyprus? And he is a Cypriot, so he's genuinely curious. Yasu um, Gumbare. So, of course, I don't live in Cyprus, but my parents do. And of course, I know uh, a lot about what's been going on. But, but you know, I would be, I, I have to admit that I'm, I'm not completely, uh, you know, in the weeds uh, like I am in American or British politics with, with Cypriot politics. But uh, I know we have a, a technocrat uh, who, Anisto Viavis, who, who is... You know, he's a he's one of those people that that will say yes uh, without really believing anything, and kind of just seem to he's he's an opportunist, right? That, that's kind of what I think is going on in Cyprus, and he always has been. When before he was uh, uh, leading that country, he he had always been an opportunist. He always sided with wh- whoever got him the 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 best result for himself. Um, and there's all the scandal with um, using private planes, and this none of this is a surprise, right? This is, you know, that he it, that was his colour from the very beginning. If you knew anything about that that man, um, the thing about Cyprus is that we are it's a country of people who have really quite striking differences um my father is one of those who uh was uh was a real supporter of uh of grivas you know and of course there's a lot (laughs) in that that i don't agree with um and he's, you know, he's a man who believes in strength and power. And, you know, there's a little bit of the Trump about my dad, you know, in a, you know, <laughs> I would, wouldn't say that. I always say this to Holly, that I always go, when, when I hear t- Trump talk, I go, that's exactly what my dad would say. And uh, and that's not to say that my dad is a horrible person because I love my dad very much. But, but you know, he's an old fashioned dude. And, uh, 
uh, and 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 these things, you know, are are just real and true. But we, the the thing about Cyprus is that it's an island that is desperate for independence, but wouldn't know what to do with it, even if if it was given to it. That that, and it, you know, I d I don't really know know what to say about that. I I I wish there was going to be some sort of solution, but I would much rather the island do its own thing. Uh, I was I'm glad that uh, certain uh, relaxation on the border where people can come and go that that seemed to have happened autonomously despite any kind of resolution or um, or deal being made. Uh, I think that is testament to the Cypriot people and how open hearted and you know just willing to just get on and just carry on living their lives as best they can and I and I really admire that about them um, but as soon as America and Britain and Turkey get involved everything turns to shit because this is an island that is so important strategically to those uh, those those countries that it will never be independent because you know imagine if it was independent and they kicked out the Americans or the British or the I mean it's just it's never going to happen. I just can't see how that's going to happen. But, um, but you know, considering considering it's you know an island that is divided, it 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 gets on with things. And I think this is just because you know people are resilient and the Cypriots are really resilient. And you know, and I'm proud to be one. You know, as much as you know, my mum would say, "Well, you're not really, are you?" But because <laughs> I was born here, but only just, right? Okay, so there are a qu quick couple of follow up questions to that. Yeah. Um, a lot of the users are curious: um, Are you from the north or south side of Cypria? I'm, yeah, I'm from the south. My parents were were bo both born in a little village called Ios Theodoros, uh, halfway between Larnaca and Limassol. So is it uh, Isoros is in the district of Larnaca? Okay, and then the next quick question: um, Do you think that peace can ever be achieved among the Greek and Turkish sides? I think uh, peace can be achieved between the 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 north and the south. Um, I think that 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 the the political will is there uh, uh, locally, nationally, should I say. Internationally, it's a different thing because, like I said, the the interests of America and Britain and Turkey are are a different thing and something that, I mean, doesn't even feel like it even matters what Cyprus thinks. It's like, well, you know, we have sat America has, uh, you know, uses it as as a as a, a place to spy on the Middle East. Britain has its basics there, and Turkey, of course. Uh, one of the big sticking points of any deal that has ever been negotiated is that Turkey never would never say when it would remove its troops from the north. Um, and as as long as it does that, there will be no deal. Um, I mean, with a with a leader that we that, that Cyprus has at the moment, I, that's the scary thing is that he's he's the kind of person that might make a deal just for the sake of it without really giving a shit what what really is the outcome of it um and that that is a that is a that's a worry i mean the reality is is that both my mum and my dad my mum particularly they worry they worry all the time you know they worry about uh, when they moved back after about 25 years they went back home and my mum was like you know, is this a good idea? Because anything could happen in Cyprus. Um, but, you know, joining Europe was a really important thing for them because they believed that whatever the economic hit they were going to take, they were they were now in a in a position of security. That was the most appropriate people is that they just wanted not to feel like Turkey could just do whatever it wanted and take the rest of the island. Because no matter how how much people like my father will go, yes, but we've got a great army, and you know, my my father fought in the guerrilla war before the invasion, and you know, kind of saw action, and you know, uh, you know, many of his friends died in that in that in that uh, in that build up to that war. So he lived it, he experienced it. 
but Turkey, <laughs> there's no no one has the the strength to to fend off Turkey. You know, if Turkey had wanted to take the whole island, it would have. I believe it was a, a a deliberate action between Britain and America to just keep the island divided because uh, you've got to remember that at the time there was the the Cuban Missile Crisis and I don't think a uh, very strong communist uh, uh, political uh, movement in in Cyprus. I think they didn't want another Cuba in the Middle East. I think they 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 would do anything to avoid that. So so I think the situation they're left in now is it is kind of perfect for but i i i you know i think as far as the uh, turkish cypriots and the greek cypriots and the the people obviously that have been moved from turkey who now live in northern uh cyprus amongst themselves you know cyprus helps the north all the time and trade happens between them it's not kind of official but you know it happens so you know there is there is vested interest, and those people kind of will will always get on because they're the same kind of people, you know. And we make a big deal about oh Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots, you know, hating each other, but they're the same kind of people. It always is the same thing. The politics always gets in the way. Talking of politics and coming a little bit closer to your current home. Um... So we have a question from Footy Surfer 1981. Um, he wants to know, do you think the British police have been too heavy handed in their response to the new COVID-19 crisis? So this is where everything kind of falls apart, right? <laughs> like this is where um, the, the anti-authoritarian uh, Marxist that I used to be has kind of left has jumped out the window because the situation we're in right now is is so serious and uh, I feel it really, really intently um, because I just think about my mum and dad and I think about how far away they are and I don't know when I'm going to see them again and it really, you know, it really breaks my heart. But But for me, I think that if people are not going to follow... I think, you know, I think our government has been very, uh, has kind of pussy-footed around. I mean, it's, you know, I, I feel so, I feel tired kind of having to go through it all again because it's, you know, like we're living it every single day right now. But it's like, there are ways of dealing with a crisis like this. Um, and I'm no scientist, I'm no doctor, but uh, I remember going to Cyprus and talking about it, uh, it was this January the 31st, and I thought it was a really big deal. I thought this is going to be big, and no one seems to give a shit what's going on. And lo and behold, here we are, uh, a month later, and the hit, the shit is hitting the fan. America doesn't isn't doing anything about it. You know, they're relying on governors to, to 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 solve their problems. No national or federal response there. And we have a government that for many, many weeks just didn't take it seriously. Boris Johnson washing, shaking hands with people and bragging about it. And uh, and here we are, you know. I think it's a, it's a it's a it's it's so serious and thousands, hundreds, millions maybe of people are going to die by the end of this year. And I think if people are not going to stay inside then the police should be putting them home, taking them home and just literally escorting them. The issue is there ain't no police. That's our problem. There are no police. They don't exist no more. They all got rid of in the last 10 years. So now we can't even enforce these rules. So that's why they have to use drones and just shame people on social media. I mean, it's completely fucked up. Okay, so Miltos, this is a bit of a. So I just turned into an authoritarian. Term. No, 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 no. No, um, I think Footy would be very happy with your response. Footy is actually a police officer in Wales, so, um, yes, he, I think good he, on you. He very much feels um that speech, but um, as a bit of a left turn, I'm aware that you had wanted to allot an hour to this, and we have we have reached that hour, and I have saved all the Game of Thrones questions to the very end. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So if you don't mind hanging around for a little bit longer, do you of mind course, if you of course, of course, yeah, yeah. Game of Thrones questions. Okay. 
Yeah, Hold of course. Them I'll pull them up. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, cool. My uh, my my computer is frozen at the moment. Um, so I am going to see what I can see. Okay. One second. Well, I, getting... I think I might just have to put my other headphones in. Oh no! Problem. I think my Thank headphones you. have died, but it's okay. Just carry on talking because I can hear you through the speaker. Go and get them. I think we'll just wait for a uh, little list to get back on. All right, I'm back. Hang on one second. Oh, take your time. Hello. Hello. Yes. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm back. That's okay. So I think um she's having some uh, technical issues. Um, but we'll just jump right into the uh, Game of Thrones questions while she's getting back set back up. Um, the first one was from Eris. Uh, Eris, uh-huh. you can go to unmute yourself and uh start whenever you're ready. Uh, which question? I think I'm back. I'm sorry about that. Hello. I had so I many. So. That's a problem. <laughs> Maybe just like pick one to start off with. Maybe the wolf hollow. Can you just remind me which one? Uh sure. It was um Oh, okay. Um what's your opinion? I, I'm sure you expected this, but what's your opinion on the Game of Thrones finale? And mm-hmm. why do you and uh why do you think there's such a crazy controversial reaction to it? Um, this is what happens when you have such a successful show that everyone loves. Uh, it's not just that; it's also because of it's kind of it was like a perfect storm. It, as soon as um, George R. R. Martin had basically been overtaken by the show. By the way, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Great. Um they were always going to run into trouble because of course the source material was so good you know the 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 his approach to telling a story that kind of felt felt familiar i.e kind of a fantasy story about dragons or you know folklore and men hairy men with swords um but turning on its head and making it into a political saga all about kind of how people kind of stab each other in the back that was really exciting and kind of the 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 the, the structure of that storytelling and the unpredictability of it that's kind of why people loved it so much because it, it literally you did not know what was going to happen from one minute to the next and that was really really exciting as soon as the the, the show overtook uh george's uh book they were always going to get into trouble because how do you how do you tell the story when when you don't have that kind of genius mind pacing it for you because you know at at the beginning he was around a lot in the first season he was around a lot he wrote the episode episode eight the episode where i have the fight with the lannisters you know so so and he did that i think he did one episode for the first three seasons um and then obviously he got very busy and very famous and other things took over and of course it was it's always the way with the writer like you have to leave it to the to the creators to kind of create your story you're not otherwise it's like it's a terrible nightmare trying to micromanage you know other people's work so so uh my attitude to the last the wet the whole thing is that i thought uh one to six were fantastic was a little bit meh about seven and a bit meh about eight. It, it, I just feel like they rushed it, but it wasn't that they rushed, they rushed it. They just 
didn't have enough material. <laughs> they just didn't have enough material. They knew what the ending was, but they just didn't know how to tell that story. And I and I don't know what happened with just making less episodes. I feel like they just bottled it. It's the only way. It's the only explanation. There's lots I liked in season seven and eight. Lots. But as a whole, and, and and I was definitely not disappointed with where the story went. I wasn't disappointed that Danny became, uh, you know, twisted by her desire for the throne. I didn't mind Bran being the 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 you know the one king at the end. Uh, I think Bran, book Bran, is a completely different. Uh, character and and entity to TV Bran because you know uh, Bran and the idea of the the Raven in the books is mystic and kind of you know omnipresent you know like it's like a mystical kind of magical supernatural creation which can be described so brilliantly in in words but so hard to do when you've got an actor in a wheelchair you know like man internal it's what the trouble with danny's story right in the beginning was like so much of it's about what's going on in her head how do you get that how do you write that and make it into into tv dynamics so hard once danny started doing stuff her character really came into its own so i think that's just a problem with creating something that is so cerebral and trying to find a way of making it visual i just think they just rushed it i think just think they did they just kind of just did too many shortcuts so everyone was like what what so uh i think that that is that's kind of how i feel about it do you think the actors were like like in the last season were disappointed themselves and how it turned or do you think they just thought it was inevitable it's so hard it's so hard uh the process of making something like that is so huge that a lot of the time you don't really know how it's going to turn out you only know when you start watching it you know you 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 know you imagine they were doing that battle scene for how many weeks five weeks day after day after day covered in mud and blood and you know like fighting at night and with smoke blowing in your face uh, i think you know as far as everyone's story is concerned everyone was like yeah this all makes sense it's fantastic but when you put it all together, I think there's a different experience happening. And I spoke to some of them and, uh, you know, I think everyone feels the same way, really. Everyone's really proud of what they did because what they did, the achievement, is huge. And they should be, be feel proud about that show. And I think a lot of the haters uh, were because when you create an, a world, you've got to remember the books had already established something, which is a universe that the, the every fan who knows those books loved. And the great thing about about books like that, like 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 uh, Lord of the Rings, like even Harry Potter, is that the universe that's created is so so vivid and is so immersive and the books take you somewhere that is so like uh vivid that that you own it it's kind of part of the deal when you read those books is that you son it's suddenly you are invested and you have skin in the game because they belong to you because you've you your imagination to amazing magical fantastical uh characters and environments and and, and so it's what happens that happened with game of thrones and ultimately once you start messing about with it and you start going hang on a minute that would or that would never happen in game of thrones that is where you really become stuck and i think that's what happened and i think that people had a very strong reaction to it because they felt that they knew better than the rock sometimes sometimes they may think there is uh an expectation also you remember we, we live in a world now where everyone has a fucking opinion and everyone everyone is going to voice it you know because like i think i think the achievement is real i think it's something that cannot be diminished in any way um 
but I do feel that they 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 rushed they rushed the last two seasons. Thank you. Um, also, I think your um, connection or something is cutting out like here or there. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. Oh no, it's okay. Um, but we did. I did understand it though. It was just like, okay. Cool. Okay, you ready for the next one, Miltos? Yes, I am. Let me know if uh, if the, the it gets really bad because I don't th- I think it just might be my connection, but you know, just let me know if it, it's getting really bad. I'll try something. So else. far, it's been pretty good. It was just that I think that last reply you just cut it out a little tiny bit. Okay. But um, so we're back on to the Game of Thrones questions. Um, we had a really good question from Magister Jax. There's sort of a two part question here. Um, the first thing they ask is. How does it feel knowing uh, you helped train Arya Stark? And the second question they asked is, if you didn't play the role that you played, um, what would have been your pick of the other characters in Game of Thrones? Um, I, oh, I feel like a proud dad. That's how I feel about. <laughs> I, that's how I feel about playing that role I mean it's nice I mean it's just it's a real great thing first of all to play a character that is much cooler uh, than yourself (laughs) and the other thing is that wow you know like kicking off uh, the protagonist story is always going to be an exciting thing you know Um, I was sad that I you know I had to kind of leave just when it was all getting exciting but you know I always kind of put it down to that thing it's like it's like Obi Wan Kenobi, isn't it? It's like you know, you kick off this the 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 the, the hero story, and um, and then they take over. So that was exciting. Um, the other thing about what was the second part of that question again? Uh, if you were going to, if you didn't play oh, yeah, the role that you played, yes. who would you have wanted to play? So I read initially before they gave me the role of Sirio to read. I read for Lord Varys uh, that uh, Conleth uh, Hill played, and I have to say that I really loved him doing that part. But I would have loved to have had a go at that. But I, he, I would definitely not have been as good as him. Um, and the other thing is that I just would have liked to have played Arya Stark because she's like my favourite character. So, and that's not even being biased because she was uh, phenomenal and and such a, I mean I remember talking about she was 13 years old and she wasn't allowed to read the book so her mother just kind of did the ed- the edited highlights for her but we all knew because by that point we knew that she was going to turn into a blind assassin and we were like this is going to be amazing you're that this little girl and you're going to turn into such a badass so we all knew that that's where her story was going so that was that was very exciting Okay, great. Um, so continuing with the Game of Thrones, um, we have a couple of questions uh, from a couple of different users about how proficient you really are with the sword. And um, <laughs> another question um, comes from Steamy, who asks, how did you feel about your Game of Thrones death being off scene? Um, uh, okay, I'll answer the first part. Um, because I have a theory about the second part. So, uh, the so I did all the all the. I mean, I had a stunt double. So did uh, Maisie. And um, I remember when I went to the uh, casting the very first time, they actually asked me. In fact, it was on the breakdown that my agent sent, saying that whoever plays this part has to be proficient at fighting and not just had done a couple of classes at drama school and I was like what does that mean does that mean they want a professional fighter because I'm pretty sure that's illegal nowadays right so um I so that was an interesting thing but for the very first time I did have something on my CV I I actually say that I had quite a lot of experience at choreography fight choreography and for the very first time in probably any actor's career it wasn't a lie, <laughs> along with like horse riding, tap dancing that most actors put down. Uh, I actually could do that. So when they asked me, do, do, can you sword fight? I was like, 
yeah, I mean, I pretty much have got quite a lot of experience because I'd worked at the RSC for about seven years by that point. And we'd done a lot of sword fighting. And I was always the one that the fight choreographer would go, OK, you get to do this because you're quite good at it and you can learn choreography quite quickly. So um, I, I I'd started off as a dancer before I did kind of pretty much any. I worked at the English National Opera and don't even ask how I managed to get that gig. But I ended up I had no dance training whatsoever. I just not like to put that out there but for some reason I ended up getting a job at the English National Opera as a dancer and everyone else in the dressing room were like proper classically trained dancers I was like I am definitely getting sacked from this job because someone's going to find out that I don't know what the fuck I'm doing but luckily I could flag my way through because I have a uh, one thing I can do is that I'm, I'm quite good physically I'm quite physically dexterous so you can give me some moves and I will remember them and, and reproduce them so that was that was a, a, a good skill to, it kind of uh, you know was was a, a useful skill when it came to the Game of Thrones um I I uh so are we so me and Maisie so had done a lot of uh contemporary dance street dance at school at the time we just did all our the moves ourselves and we were proud that we never got got to use our stunt doubles because you should have seen my stunt double he was a, a guy called ginge and he was uh he was completely ginger and he had a, a, a curly black wig <laughs> and a fake beard so i'm really glad he didn't get to to to, to do any of the behind the you know behind the the scene stuff so so we we were very very proud that we did all the choreography ourselves so yeah that's all us. And so and so the, the the second question about the death, the off screen death. I asked George R. Martin about this and he he said it's very deliberate, very deliberate because he he in the books, the mantra, the the, the, the quotes, the the you know, still as quite as quite as a snake, as still as I I can't even remember them, it's so long ago. But those those mantra, the mantra um Sir Pharrell, Veer cuts deeper than swords, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, uh Aria repeats over and over again, even throughout the books. It's kind of the thing she comes back to. She keeps repeating them over and over in her head at moments of stress and you know, give her and um it's kind of like a, a force ghost, you know, it's like Obi Wan Kenobi kind of going use the force Luke. It's it's that. So the idea, and this is my theory, uh kind of a kind of thought about it a lot as you can imagine is that if if Arya had seen uh Syria Pharrell's death and remember the book is written in 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 points of view so it goes from one character's point of view to another so when Arya leaves that room you leave the room with her and and so the idea is that it's left open ended so that the echo is kind of left alive so if she'd seen the trauma of him being cut down and killed i think it would have done something inside her head which wouldn't have allowed her to kind of keep that idea of his teachings alive in her head but because there was an ambiguity to it it kind of almost left an echo of it and so i think that deliberate uh device that george uses to to just keep that character alive in her head okay great um so there's the next question sort of leads on from that point which is obviously <clears throat> you had you had a strong role um even though you didn't make it till the end um and this user asks is it hard to go from playing such a magical larger than life character back to your mundane life do you feel like the characters you play continue to grow on you? Um, or is it more of a fantasy and once you're done for the day, you know, it's done? I feel like that is true. It, it, it's like for me, I mean, I haven't had the experience of doing a character for a long period of time. You know, like when actors who are in long show play the character and they're there creating an arc and a storyline goes on years. I don't know what it's like 
because my work as a character actor I've always ever done kind of small parts here and there and and but it suits me because I really love the variety I think as I said I do get bored quite easily and no matter how exciting a part is part of my enjoyment as an actor is what the next challenge is going to be what the next role is going to be what the next thing and and that really uh fuels me and and makes me excited about work so so as much as I would have loved to have had the opportunity to create a character that kind of had a huge arc and kind of went somewhere uh, it, it's 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 okay I kind of enjoy I enjoy the fact the variety is really keeps it's really really keeps me uh, excited about what I do okay um so we have another question from steamy who asks what are your thoughts about the book version of Syria being described as nothing like you <laughs> well we talked about uh shaving my head very seriously and one of the things they asked me is that do you mind shaving your head and I was like yeah don't mind because you know part of, part of the reason why I love being an actor is the dressing up before I wanted to be an actor I actually wanted to be a special effects makeup artist because that's what I really like is that is the whole prosthetics I grew up on watching um, American Werewolf in London and grotesque horror films where where you know special effects and makeup and arrows through eyes was 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 all I kind of watched when I was a teenager kind of explains a lot but uh that's what really excited me so that's I think that's what I would have done if I hadn't been an actor it's kind of gone into being a special effects makeup artist um I bought books on it and I used to spend all my pocket money on fake blood and nose putty and liquid latex and just make up my friends for parties and stuff so um I I what was the question again? What do you think um, of the differences between yes. you cast the serial and the character? And yeah. So we talked about shaving my head. Um, but in the end, George, uh, it went all the way to the top. And in the end, George R. R. Martin said, the reason why I wrote Syria the way I did is because he had to be different to the hairy northerners who were big and hairy and with big beards and so he, the way he describes them as small with a beaky nose slight to, so to give him a, a really different look but then when he saw me and i did the, the the voice and the accent he was like that is different enough he is someone who comes from an exotic ostentatious place and and it completely reads like that. So so as as far as we we did kind of go down the route of, of changing my appearance to make me more like the book, but in the end George kind of vetoed it and just said no, you you know, just do it like Inigo Montoya. <laughs> that, well, hey, I mean you brought your own spin to it, right? And that's yeah. that's what makes it unique and and yeah. important. Um, so we've had a couple of questions um, in previous sec segments and now sort of more to do with Game of Thrones. Um, but a user asked, how many accents can you imitate? How long does it take for you to practice and learn for an accent for a role? Which accent is your favorite to do? And a follow on from that is um, Eris asked, what inspired your accent specifically for Syrio and what kind of guidance were you given? Uh Really good questions. So um, I'm awful at doing regional British accents. Don't ask me why. I can do them, but I have to study them. Right? I have to really study them and I kind of have to do the breakdown and all of that and kind of really kind of analyse the words and how they work in the mouth and all of that. So that just takes work. So I, I do do them, but I, I don't find it very easy. But for some weird reason, doing international accents particularly southern european middle eastern that kind of stuff i don't know maybe it's because i can speak uh greek and maybe because of that kind of part maybe growing up around i mean remember i when i grew up my dad was a restaurateur and he knew the spanish and the italians and the the persians so so he kind of 
uh, I was just surrounded by different accents and maybe as a child that just left an impression in my head so I can I can hear it and I can recreate those accents I wouldn't say like effortlessly it you know I have to do my research because I don't want to kind of sound like I'm just faking it if I'm asked to do an accent I really I know usually when you're doing it on film you you get a speech di- you know, a dialect coach and they kind of work on it my favorite one is doing it for young marks where I had to play a a, a, a a French anarchist who just wanted to blow up London and um who was the in fact the last person to be hanged in London uh I can't even remember his name now but he was a French revolutionary and he he doing his accent was fantastic because I just had to be really aggressive all the time and being aggressive in a French accent is really really good fun so so uh, that was my favorite that I've done recently and um as far as Sirio Pharrell's um I've said this before but my my starting point was my dad so I started with my dad's accent and then just pushed it further east because I uh, what I had to what was really important in my head was that it it shouldn't be something specific so I kind of that's why the overuse of the rolled R which now when I listen to it I just hate but uh I just wanted it to sound um different to anything that kind of exists because of course Bravosi was um, something that is a made up, you know, but I kind of kind of made me think of Persia, the Middle East and that kind of thing. So uh, that's kind of, but my, the starting point was my father. So I just did an impersonation of my dad and then just kind of bastardized it. Um, and when it comes to what, this is the other weird thing is like, I turned up and I was going to do that first scene. I was like, went up to David and Dan and I was like, well, how do I pronounce uh, Bravosi? And he went, well, you're the first person to say it. So however you say it, is the way it's going to be said. So so they just gave me free reign. So that was kind of great and also daunting because I was like, all right. So they didn't give me any advice. They just said, and I also said, how do you want me to play this character? I just realized that they hadn't rehearsed with me. They just went, they looked at the fight choreography and they just liked it. They said, make it a bit more tango. And that was the only direction I got from them. And the rest was just do it the way you did it in the, in the audition. I was like, really? Okay then. <laughs> so, so that's how it, how it was. I mean, it's kind of great about people like that. And when you work in that environment is that when they cast you, they truly trust you. It can't be said for all directors I've worked with because some just want you to do it to do it in a way that is kind of like them rather than the way that you would do it. But it's a real testament to the trust that they put in us because they just went, no, we cast you for a reason. You just trust your instincts. You do it the way you want to do it because that's what you That's really amazing that you had that opportunity. Really was, yeah. Forget it. Now, I'm very aware that you had given us an hour of your time and it's now been an hour and a half. So um, unless you're wanting to continue, um, we have one last question and then we would love to hear about your um, charity that you support, if that's okay. Yes, 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 let's do that, yeah. And listen, if, if, if people are desperate for me to answer some other questions at another time, I'm willing to come back because, hey, we're going to be in lockdown for a little while to come. You know. Well, I I will definitely talk with you about that at the end of this. Um, uh, but we will let you decompress from this wonderful yes. uh, AMA yeah. that you've given us, and um, we'll definitely be in touch with that. But the last question comes from Consul Eris, and I think it's a great question to end on because obviously a lot of people are here because of your your role in Game of Thrones, and that's how they know you. Um, what do you think most of the actors wish fans knew about the show? That's really good. That's a really good one. I could say that uh, one of the things that the fans should know about the show, something they don't know, is how uh, we did that very first season and the, no one knew what it was going to be. The level of excitement, I remember all of us, we all shared, we, we all stayed in the same hotel and uh, I remember seeing Jason Momoa for the very first time holding someone above his head in the bar 
telling a story, which is kind of just what he does. And uh, and that kind of just sum, sums him up. It's like, okay. Um, but but we were all standing outside the pub smoking a fag. Kit Harrington, Alfie Allen. Uh, all of us sitting like really nervously smoking fags outside. Talking, the boys talking about how they were working out. They're like, you know, they're going to have to really do lots of nude scenes and stuff. And the kind of the excitement and, the, and no one knowing, but kind of feeling like some, this was something important. And and that those those days, those days, so young, fresh faced and naive, uh, never, never, never forgot. You know, the thing is about on that show to the point to the to the to the very last uh, filming the of season eight the last episode they never lost that feeling of being in something that they felt was a once in a lifetime experience and that for whatever whatever you think about how the show turned out that everyone had that feeling and it never never changed it was just about being really excited and you imagine they worked really hard. They did hours and hours and early mornings and that fight scene that they did in the last episode, last season that nearly killed them all. That never, never left them. And I think that is a real testament to an environment of doing something that, that everyone loved and everyone believed in. And whether they rushed it and all of that is neither here nor there. The fact is that everyone gave everything, everything they, they had. The other thing, so that that's a serious answer to the question. The the, the more facetious aspect one is is that most of the actors have never read the books, and and most of them don't even watch the TV show. <laughs> they they love doing it, but half of them are too busy to even watch the show. <laughs> I remember doing conventions. We still do conventions, and they get asked questions about the show, about a scene, and they go can't really tell you anything i can tell you what it was like filming it well for just half the time i don't remember what it was like filming it because i certainly haven't seen the episode so there's that too well thank you so much for um providing us with such an entertaining charming and beguiling ama um it genuinely was a lovely break from all the stress that everyone has had to go through with the current pandemic yeah well um, yeah and I know that you support a charity that works with mental health. So I'd love to give you the opportunity to just share a little bit about it, you know, what it means to you and where people can go to support it. We will have links um, in the server for anyone who wishes to support this charity. But Miltos, the floor is yours to talk about Mind. Thank you. So it's Mind. It's a mental health charity. It's a charity that I've had, you know, uh, been involved in raising money for them awareness for them and also used you know because of people that I've loved and people and myself um, uh, as you know and I'm sure this is the same all over the world you know uh, we're all much more aware of mental health and the fact that it isn't something that happens to other people but that that is a universal thing it's a state of we live our lives and how we, we we process things and how we we deal with things and so we all have um a need to look after our mental health and and mind is is fantastic because it provides support it's it's uh man telephone lines that you can any time of the day or night they raise awareness they go into school, into workspaces they um provide um services like uh, counseling therapy they put people in touch with people and they're doing it all as a charity so because it's something that that is very personal to me for many many reasons it's it's it was my my go-to thing so when i started doing uh convention um uh i would always kind of talk about it and try and raise money uh, cause uh, funding for the and you know things are changing I, don't, I wouldn't say they're changing that much uh, there's a willingness to do more um, through you know government 
uh, funding to do more in the health service for people for, for mental health uh, 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 treatment and facilities, uh, but it's kind of just it's, it's I don't see really anything. Uh, you know, our health Britain is dreadfully underfunding, underfunded, and uh, and so the last thing we to do is provide the services that we all need when it comes to mental health and and mind really is doing that work and so that's why they're so important and why they're so so important to to everyone um and i know that there are a uk-based charity but there are charities all over the world that are doing the same thing and uh, and so yeah it's it to me it's it's really important we give them as much money because you know, without them, we would have nothing, you know, really, when it comes to how, how to... That's my Siri. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, they, they, they are a charity very close to my heart, and, uh, and they need as much support as, as we can give them. Well, we will be sure to make sure that they get decent exposure on the server over the next week or so, and um, when this AMA goes up on our YouTube channel, we will make sure that we have the links on the YouTube video. Thank so you so much. Can go find mine. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, we really appreciate it. If you're not a member of the server, thank you for coming to the AMA. Uh, I know both myself and the staff um, were really happy to have you here and for you to participate. Um, if you'd like to join the server, you can of course submit an application. Um, hmm. and we do other fun events like this, usually more around politics and philosophy, but we like to to switch it up and have something a little bit more lighthearted and fun um, with the current uh, pandemic and just sort of distracting people from being stuck at home. So we appreciate I think you it's all really for participating. Good. Yeah, uh, you were yeah, absolutely no, lovely, it, Miltus. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. And yeah, I really you want so to thank everyone. Coming. My pleasure. And I just wanted to say to everyone last at the end, just to, you know, to say, stay safe. And uh, I know it's really, really tough at the moment and people must be kind of having all sorts of strange experiences right now, but I'm really glad that we could have done this. And so it was a real pleasure to do it. But, and any time, and if you want me, you know, anything, you want to talk about anything specific, if you want to talk to me about politics, I'm ready to do that. <laughs> well, Miltos, I might have I might have a, a proposition for you for a later date um, to do with All politics because right. I know that a lot of people would be very interested to hear more about your political views as well as your career. Okay. okay. All right, well, my dear, I have really a wonderful day and thank you for coming. My pleasure. Take care, everyone. Bye.